as we begin this Advent season, I know that many people who don't come to church, and even many of us who do come to church, might feel like the little boy who once was preparing for the annual Christmas pageant in his church. He was preparing to be one of the Magi, bringing in a gift to the baby in the manger, and he was rehearsing his lines with his mother. But before he could finish rehearsing his lines, he stopped short and he looked at his mother and he said, Mom, can't we just change the story a little bit this year? It's the same thing year after year after year. Well, it is the same story. Year after year after year. But it's a story that we need to hear over and over again because sometimes our familiarity with the story causes us to be blind to the richness and the depth of the story. Year after year, we turn to these same scripture passages. We sing the same beautiful hymns. And we do so because it's so easy for us to forget. We don't do them simply out of nostalgia. We do them because we need reminders that the light has overcome the darkness. We need reminders that we live as a people of hope, not a people who live in fear. We need reminders that love and life have the last word, not death and sorrow. And the truth is, we can never hear those messages enough. Over the next few weeks, we will be looking at the stories of the angelic visits, the visits of the angels. Today, we'll look at the visit of the angel to Zechariah. Next week, we'll look at the visit of the angel to Mary, and then to Joseph, and then to the shepherds who were watching over their flocks by night. And we'll contemplate how there are angels among us bringing messages of God's love and God's grace. Now, the angels in Scripture don't always line up with our picture of angels from the movies and books and paintings that we've seen. Angels in the Holy Scripture are always messengers of God, bringing good news to the people of God. And we need to hear their news of more hope, more peace, more joy, and more love. Throughout this season of Advent, I want to encourage those of you who are engaged in social media to use the hashtags, more hope, more peace, more joy, and more love, to share with others who follow you on social media the messages of the angels, the messages of where you see God's hope, God's peace, God's joy, and God's love at work in the world today, so that we can offer a message that flies in the face of a culture of fear and division, bringing those gifts that Christ brings to us, to our world. As we think about these beautiful stories of the gifts of hope and peace and joy and love that the Christ child brings to us, we need to realize that they were brought into a context of a world like ours, a world in which God's voice had remained silent for 400 years. In that time period, there was turmoil in the world and division in the world. The prophets were no longer speaking, and the people who followed God held on to the hope 
of God's promise of a Messiah. Throughout the Greek conquest, the Roman conquest, and now during Herod's reign, they held on to a sliver of hope in a world that seemed so filled with dissension and darkness, a world much like our world today. And so these messages of the angels are messages that I believe we need to hear. How many of you remember the story of George Bailey in The Wonderful Life? Probably everybody, right? It's another story that you hear so often, and we watch it over and over again this time of year. Well, it's really a parable about faithfulness. It's a parable about family and responsibility, but mostly it's a parable about hope and how God intervenes in our world. You remember that George is one of those great guys that everybody loves. He's selfless and easygoing, and he always wants to help other people out. But a crisis comes up in his life, and the bank examiner discovers that there is some missing money. Missing money that his uncle Billy has mistakenly left at the bank. An old man's potter's greed and jealousy has overtaken it. But George is the one who's willing to take the fall for his Uncle Billy. But when he arrives home, his daughter, Zuzu, has come home with the sniffles. And when the teacher calls the house to find out how Zuzu's doing, George can't handle it. And he yells at the teacher for allowing his little girl to get sick at school. He leaves the teacher in tears, and her husband swears that he's going to come and knock George Bailey's block off. So George caves in, and he goes to the local bar for a drink, and sitting there, he prays a prayer of despair. Do you remember that? He admits to God, I'm not a praying man, but he asks God to intervene and to show him a way out. In his despair, two of his friends try to talk him into going home, that he's had enough to drink, he needs to go home, and they call him by name. Well, when they call out his name, the man who is seated next to him happens to be the teacher's husband. And he goes off and he slugs George in the mouth. George gets up off the floor and wipes the blood away from his lip. And he says, that's what I get for praying. And he goes out to do the unthinkable. He decides the only way out is to take his life. And he checks in his pocket to make sure that he's got his life insurance policy. And you know the rest of the story, right? His guardian angel shows up and intervenes and shows him what the town would have been like if he had not lived. Gives him a renewed sense of hope, a hope that comes from a new release on life. And I think one of the reasons that we like this movie so much, that so many people watch it over and over again, is because we know what it's like to be George Bailey. We know what it's like to feel at the edge of despair. We've all felt the total uncertainty of life at one time or another. We've all come to a point or will come to a point that we feel like we're at the end of our rope and we don't know how to help ourselves and we cry out to God for help. We need hope, hope in the midst of life's uncertainties. That's the reason why we as a church need to hear these stories of Scripture over and over again, 
because we are like George. And if we're not like George today, we know other people who are like George. We encounter them at work or at school. We encounter them in our neighborhood and in our family gatherings. We know people who are feeling the weight of despair. When we think of the Christmas story, we often jump over the very beginning that Luke tells us in Luke chapter 1. We jump straight to Luke chapter 2. We want to hear about the shepherds hearing the good news and about the baby being born in a manger. But when we do, we miss an important part of the message of hope. For the story of Christmas does not start with Mary and Joseph. The story of Christmas starts with an elderly couple, a priest, Zechariah, and his wife, Elizabeth. An elderly couple who had been praying for years to have a child. Listen to how Luke starts the story in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. During the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron, they were both righteous before God, blameless in their observance of all the Lord's commands and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to become pregnant, and they both were very old. What a strange way for God to begin the story of the birth of Christ, isn't it? by telling us about an elderly couple who can't have children. An old priest and his wife who've been praying for children of their own, waiting and waiting for their child to be born. The scriptures say, one day Zechariah was serving as priest before God because his priestly division was on duty. And following the customs of priestly service, he was chosen by lottery to go into the Lord's sanctuary to burn the incense. All the people who gathered to worship were praying outside during this hour of incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and paralyzed with fear. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will give birth to your son, and you must name him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many people will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the Lord's eyes. He must not drink wine or liquor. He must be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. He will bring many Israelites back to the Lord their God. He will go forth before the Lord equipped with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of fathers back to their children, and he will turn the disobedient to righteous patterns of thinking. He will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How can this be? My wife and I are old. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the Lord's presence. I was sent to speak to you and to bring good news to you. Know this. What I have spoken will come true at the proper time. But because you didn't believe, you will remain silent, unable to speak until the day these things happen. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered why he was in the sanctuary for such a long time. 
And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he gestured to them that he could not speak. And when he completed the days of his priestly service, he returned home. Afterward, his wife Elizabeth did become pregnant. She kept to herself for five months, saying, This is the Lord's doing. He has shown his favor to me by removing my disgrace among other people. This is the word of God for us today, my friends. It is a word that I believe we need to hear in today's world. It is a word that we need to hear about hope and prayer. Imagine Zechariah and Elizabeth. Put yourself in their place. They've been praying for a child for years, and it seems like God is so distant and so silent. It seems like God will never answer their prayers. I'm sure there was a season in their life when every time they prayed, this was the prayer that was on their lips, a petition before God, the deepest desire of their heart to have a baby. Dear God, we want a child. But at some point, after praying and praying and praying and feeling that God was silent or deaf to their prayers, I imagine they made their peace without an answer. They just buried that hope and that dream somewhere deep inside of them some kind of pain that they didn't want to touch anymore or even talk about in words. And they only thought about it when they saw children playing in the temple or in the marketplace. I know what that pain is like. I couldn't give birth to children myself. And for years, literally years, when children were baptized in worship services, I could look at the child. I would sit and silently cry, cry over my grief, dear Lord, will I never have a baby? I prayed and I prayed, will I ever get a baby? And it came to a point that I lost hope in having a child. And I said to myself, I will never be a parent standing at the altar with a baby of my own to baptize. It's not just the birth of the child. It was all the hopes and the dreams that went with it that I would never be able to experience as I buried that hurt deep down inside. Maybe you have prayers like that, that you feel God will never answer, that you have buried deep inside, pains that are deep inside of you. Zechariah and Elizabeth had all but given up all hope. They had not lost faith in God, and we know that because he continued to serve as a priest in the temple. And he continued to serve faithfully. The scripture said very plainly that they were blameless. Blameless, that doesn't mean that they did everything that was right. That means that they had all humility and love for God that the law required. They held on to their belief in God. And the scriptures go on to say that Zechariah one day is serving in the temple. And as he is serving on behalf of the people offering incense, he steps into the mystery of God once again. He steps into the center of the people's praise and worship. 
He was selected as the one priest who was able to go into the Holy of Holies to the very presence of God. And I wonder what he was thinking. This God who has been so silent in my life, I come before his altar now of praise and worship. I come before his altar now to perform this ritual. I wonder what he was thinking as he stood there. Maybe it was a mix of emotions like most of us preachers feel when we stand before a congregation. I know I certainly always feel a mixture of emotions. Anticipation or maybe a touch of stage fright. Will I say the right things? Will people hear it the right way? A little bit of ego pushed in there, wanting to have people say thank you. Weighted concerns for the temple and the budget, the staffing and the differences among people. Worried about the needs of the people, their hurts and their prayers. Maybe worried about whether or not his stole was on right and if people would say something about how he looked. Just a bundle of thoughts and feelings. A mixture of faith and doubt, too carrying on this ancient ritual, lifting up prayers and wondering why his own prayer had not been answered. And if the crowd outside was much like most congregations, they too had a mix of emotions, hope and hunger, dedication and despair, holiness and hollowness, sinfulness and saintliness. We're all a mixed bag. And they came, they came anyway to this place of worship. Frederick Beekner, in one of my favorite books that he wrote called A Room to, called Remember, asked why, do any, why does anybody come to church? And he says, my guess is they come because there isn't much else to do on Sunday morning. They come to see their friends. They come to be seen. They come out of habit and tradition. They come to be entertained. They come to be edified. They come. Even the ones in the secrets of their hearts who believe very little, they come with the idea that maybe, just maybe, God keeps track of who comes and who doesn't come. Kind of like Santa Claus's list of naughty and nice. They come year after year, and who is to say how, if at all, their lives are changed as a result? But they keep coming anyway, and beneath all of those lesser reasons, there is a deeper reason, a deeper reason that we can characterize as hope. They christen their babies, they bury their dead, they hollow their vows of covenant in marriage believing and hoping that there is a God who will bless them, a God who will hear and seal their vows, receive their children, and raise up their dead in resurrection. Further down in their daydreams and their boredom, there is hope. Hope that somewhere in the words that the preacher preaches and the words of Scripture that are read, in the music that is sung and in the silences of this place, somewhere in this mystery, there is something greater than the cosmos itself, and they will hear a voice speaking their names and blessing them. Zechariah came to such a holy moment, a mixture of all those emotions with that unfulfilled desire of a son. And right there in the midst of that altar and that incense, the angel came and told him that the child would be born. And Luke says in the understatement of the year, right, that Zechariah was troubled with fear. He was paralyzed with fear and trembling at the sight and the words of the angel. 
The angel said, do not be afraid. God has heard your prayer. You thought God was silent and distant, but God was listening the entire time. And this is the basic affirmation, my friends. The basic message of this season, the foundation of our faith. God is always listening. When God seems silent, God is not distant. God is listening. The fact is, this story is about God's faithfulness, not about Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's about the fact that God does hear our prayers. He cares for us, and God does respond in God's time. In the days of Noah, when the world was corrupt and filled with sin, God heard the cries and responded. In the days of Moses, when the people were in bondage in Egypt, God heard the cries of his people and called up Moses and delivered them from slavery and led them to the sea through freedom. In the days of the prophets, the people heard the voice of God and God's words of hope. And now in the days of Herod, God is speaking again, telling Zechariah to let the people know that the promise of a Savior is coming and that his son John will be the one to clear the path. The foundation of faith is God's faithfulness to us. Even when God seems absent, God has not left us. As the great hymn says, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. When Zechariah receives this news, the scripture says he is speechless, tongue-tied and dumb. He can't even tell his wife the news. He has to write it out on a tablet to speak to anyone. And you know the rest of the story, how John is born and he becomes John the baptizer who baptizes Jesus. I used to think that Zechariah being speechless was a punishment. A punishment for him asking the angel, how can this be? Not believing when the angel said, you will have a son. But I'm not so sure that it really was a punishment anymore. I think it was a reminder to us of what silence can do for our faith. You see, during that time that Zechariah was silent, he was able to listen and pay attention to God's handiwork in the world. When we're so busy decorating trees and buying gifts and running around, we don't always have time to hear God's still, small voice in this world. We don't often have time to notice the people around us what their hurts and needs are, and how we can be a friend just by sitting with them. I think it was a reminder that when we feel like God is silent, God is with us, listening, sitting with us. Think about the times that you've had really tough times in life, maybe going through a time of grief or pain. You don't need people who are just babbling and telling you what to think or feel. The most comfort you receive is from someone sitting with you in silence. Silence. The presence of God with us, giving us hope that God will respond to meet our deepest needs. So I want to challenge each one of us and invite us to do something. Invite us to do something for the rest of this day to practice silence and to see what hope it stirs up in us. 
to see how it might awaken some of those dreams and hopes that we thought would never be answered and fulfilled. Sit in silence when you drive home today. If there are others in the car with you, resist the temptation to critique the sermon today. Because I know that happens. But sit in silence listening for God's voice to you, stirring up hopes and dreams that God will fulfill in your life, those visions of how the world might be better, those things that you think are impossible, remembering that the scriptures say what is impossible with us is possible with God. Instead of the hustle and bustle around a meal table today, sit in silence with one another. And may you hear God's voice speak to you, the voice of hope, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.